All right, let's get started from where we left off. So we just recently started talking about Rice's theorem. Oops, I gotta let my talk out. Sorry about, sorry about that. So we need to talk about Rice's theorem, which was saying that um, every non-trivial property property of a Turing machine languages is undecidable. And we used uh, Rice's theorem to prove a certain language to be undecidable. And some examples of where we can use this are, for example, ETM. Uh, we gave a different proof, but you can use Rice's theorem uh, for this. You can use it for all TM or a whole host of other uh, languages where there are properties of Turing machine languages, meaning that they are of the form, uh, the language has Turing machines in it. So M is a Turing machine and something about the language of the machine holds. So like L of M could be infinite or has three strings in, in it or something. And as long as it's non-trivial, then it's undecidable. So here's the thing. So how do we actually prove Rice's theorem? So if it says that every non-trivial property is undecidable, then we can't just do a one by one proof of every such language because there are obviously infinitely many possible choices that we could pick for uh, the for, for what the property is. So we need to be able to prove this in a much more general context. So let's let uh, P be such a property, be a non-trivial uh, property of Turing machine languages. Okay, so what we need to be able to do is to show that P is undecidable. But let's suppose that it was decidable. So suppose that P were decidable by some decider, although we don't really care what the decider's name is. So the way that we're going to actually prove this is the very similar way that we actually proved ETM undecidable. And how did that go? Well, we supposed it was decidable. And then what we did was, supposing it was decidable, we made a decider for ATM. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. So, or, or at least that's the idea. So we will try to decide ATM as follows. So remember ATM, that problem takes a Turing machine and input. So on input MW, where M is a Turing machine, W a string. And we gotta figure out whether M accepts W. Well. Because P is a non-trivial, it's just any trivial property, I guess non-trivial property, my mistake. Um, I can't just ask the decider for P whether or not this Turing machine is in there because it tells us nothing about whether M accepts W. So like before, we're going to construct a Turing machine, uh, let's call it M prime. And as always, it gets an arbitrary input, just some input X. So here's how this is going to work. So the, there are other ways that you can actually prove this. So what we're going to make an assumption is we're going to assume that, um, let's just call it a machine M sub empty is in the property P and where 
the language of this guy is empty. So it's, it's just a machine that rejects everything or, or just never accepts anything for sure. Uh, actually, sorry, we'll, we'll assume it's not in P. And why can we assume that? Well, suppose it were in P in the, in the non-trivial property. Well, because decidable languages are closed under complement, and you can just um, be sure of that because if it's a decider, you can just swap Q accept and Q reject. So because P is decidable by assumption, we can swap P and the complement of P and in the proof and it will go out exactly the same way. So we're going to assume that M sub M T is not in the property P, although, although it doesn't have to be because uh, in the machine that we're building, we're going to actually agree with what the decider does, but we could equally just uh, do the opposite of what it does. So the, there's no, no real difference there, but we're just asserting the existence of a machine that's in there. And because it's a non-trivial property, well, M sub empty is not in there. Well, then there must be some other Turing machine with a different language that is in there. So suppose that uh, T is a Turing machine with uh, T being in the property. So uh, we're assuming that the any machine with the empty language is not in there, and uh, there must be some machine in with the property because it's a non-trivial one. So let's just call it T. There must be one. So how's the M prime machine gonna work? It's the first step of it is to simulate the original Turing machine we were given, M on W. So just simulate M on W. If M rejects W, we will reject X. Okay, so if M says no, I, I just reject, then we will never accept anything. But suppose that uh, it does accept W. Then what we'll do is we'll, we'll run T on X and accept if T accepts. So what in the world is this machine doing? So let's see. So there are, there are two outcomes. So either, or actually I guess three, um, M accepts W, something can happen. M outright rejects W, something can happen. Or M runs forever on W, that can also happen. So if M accepts W, well, this if statement will not be taken which means that we will always go to step B down here. Which means that since X right here is an arbitrary input of the machine M prime, well, M prime is just behaving like T would have done. Because um, the fact that M accepts W has no bearing on what M prime has was going to accept. So, the, mach the machine M prime behaves like the machine T. So that means that the language of M prime is just the same as T because it accepts exactly the same um, strings as T does, which implies that because they have the same language, M, oops, M prime is in the property because T is because it's a property of Turing machine languages. Any two machines with the same language must be uh, in the, either both in the property or both not. So if M rejects W, well then that means we will never ex execute step um, B here, which means that we will always be rejecting the input X because the outcome is always the same. M will always reject W in this case. So that means that M prime never accepts anything. So L of M prime is empty. It doesn't accept anything. Well, by assumption, the, um, the machine with empty language 
is not in a property P. So that means because uh, these two have the same language, then that implies that M prime is not in P. And similarly for running forever, well, if it ran forever, we will never accept anything in the first place. So that means that the language of M prime again is empty, which implies that M prime is not in the property P. Okay, so the uh, M prime is in the property P if and only if M accepts W, which is the contradiction. So run the decider for P on input M prime if um, it accepts a we will accept oops accept uh, otherwise reject so we just do exactly the same thing that the decider does okay so the uh, the way that we proved etm undecidable was that we had the machine have two different behaviors that are hingent on whether m accepts w it's exactly the same thing here, but it's just in a more general context. So, uh, because um, ATM is undecidable, that implies P is undecidable, which is the contradiction, obviously. And, and actually, uh, one thing we should check is, does this run in a finite amount of time? Um, well, step one is just making a machine that's, it's not running anything, so there's no problem there. Step two, by assumption, runs in a finite amount of time, and then step three does. So, uh, therefore, we get the contradiction down here. Okay, so uh, that is a proof of Rice's theorem. So, let's actually uh, use that to prove uh, something else to be undecidable. So, and one thing we should note, so this does not um, tell us anything about whether the language is recognizable or not. So it's only a test about whether it's uh, decidable. So uh, if you're asked in some context of proving a language is recognizable, you can't use Rice's theorem to, to be able to say that. If for decidable, yeah, you might be able to. So let's just look at this language, which is all the uh, all the Turing machines uh, with uh, the language of the machine having at most three strings in it. So in other words, um, M accepts at most three strings. So uh, it looks like that this will be undecidable, and in fact it is. So let's actually prove that this is undecidable. So to apply Rice's theorem, if you remember, we have to show two things. We have to show that it's a property of Turing machine languages. And secondly, we have to show that it's non-trivial. If you want to use Rice's theorem, you have to prove both of these. So is it a property of Turing machine languages? Well, if two machines have the same language, well, could it be the case that one of them uh, accepts uh, fewer than three strings and one accepts more than three. Well, that's not possible because the languages are the same. So if the language of M1 equals the language of M2, and one thing to note here because some students messed this up, is that these two are arbitrary, arbitrary Turing machines. They're not like specific machines. They're arbitrary machines and just happen to have the same language. Well, if they're the same, then uh, either both have less than or equal to three strings, or neither do. So that's pretty easy to see. Uh, is it non-trivial? So we need an example of a machine that um, has the property, which means that it has fewer than three strings, and we need an example that has more than three strings. So the easy examples, which you should refer to most often, is um, uh, the empty set and sigma star. 
these are really common examples when showing non-trivial. So let's let uh, X be a Turing machine with the language of X being empty. So then that means it accepts less than three strings, which means that X is in this um, language, 3TM. And uh, the other case, let's let Y be a Turing machine with the language of Y, language of Y, make my Y's better, equal to sigma star. Well, that's not at most three strings, so that means that Y is not in three, yeah, three TM. So then we can conclude by Rice's theorem, and you have to say this because just by saying property and non-trivial, someone reading your proof might not know what's happening. So by Rice's theorem, uh, three TM is undecidable. So it's, it mirrors the proof that we did at the end of last lecture. No problem. Okay. So we're going to start looking at a, another um, somewhat unrelated problem, but get back to uh, some of the languages we didn't talk about before. So in the back of our minds, let's think about all CFG and EQ CFG. And we showed that uh, EQ CFG is decidable if, uh, oh, no, no, sorry. Um, all CFG is decidable if EQ CFG is decidable. But I claimed last, uh, maybe last lecture or two ago, that um, neither of these is decidable. So they're both undecidable, but uh, we don't, well, we can't apply Rice's theorem to it because they, the Rice's theorem only works with Turing machines. They, it doesn't work with context-free grammars, and there actually is no, as far as I know, Rice's theorem for context-free grammars. So we'll actually need uh, a different uh, technology to be able to prove that they're undecidable. So how do we prove that they're undecidable? So the thing that I want to talk about here is something called a computation history. And, and so the proof for these being undecidable is actually um, pretty slick in what it actually does, but it's, uh, it's really hard to think about how you would prove this if you didn't know of the strategy in advance. But it's pretty amazing what this method could actually do. So a computation history of a Turing machine. So this is a Turing machine computation history. M on input W is a sequence uh, of configurations. C0, C1, C2, up to, let's call the last one CM. So remember, configurations is something like, on the tape we have W1, W2, up to W. I, and then a state that's looking at the next one to the right, and then some rest of tape contents. So these were uh, tape contents, and so is this one, this part, and this part is the state. So um, it's a sequence of configurations where uh, were one, C0 is the start config. So it must be Q0 followed by W. And for all uh, I, CI yields CI plus one. Make my eyes a little better. Yeah, so it just it's just a sequence of configurations. If you looked at each one of them in turn, you can see how the, the machine is actually progressing. And it, it's actually the thing that we 
did when we first started talking about Turing machines, when we were just simulating the machine and seeing what happens and writing all the configurations down. So uh, one more thing, a, uh, so, so what I'm going to do here is, yeah, so I'm going to say a computation history is accepting and I'm going to call this an accepting computation history, so ACH. If CM is accepting, and you can equally call a computation history rejecting if CM is rejecting one. So accepting means that the, if you, could, if you recall, the state in there within the configuration is QAccept. So, which means it's the last one. Okay. So, let's see. So, why are we even talking about this? So, uh, what we're going to be talking about is something called a linear bounded automaton. And this is actually uh, used in a different name in your uh, homework. Oh, I think homework nine. So this is called an LBA. I think I called it a space bounded Turing machine or something, but it's exactly the same thing. So is uh, exactly like a Turing machine, except uh, can we can't ever move right past the input. So the, uh, the machine can only um, do its work within the confines of where the input is. So suppose that we have a tape here, but note that it has an end because the input's length is finite. So let's just say we have an input W1, W2, up to Wn. Well, what we can do to say, well, let's just say we're looking at this cell, and eventually we move our way right and are here and want to move right. Well, there's what we're going to do on both ends to make, because we can't actually move the input around, is we're going to put a special character on both ends, although it's not really important. Um, the It's just to note that you can know when you're at the end of the input, So you, because we can't actually move the input around. So... It's exactly like a Turing machine though. So you can write into the positions, into those end positions. You can move left and right and all that stuff. And there's still a Q accept, Q reject, all that stuff. So the let's talk about the acceptance problem for LBAs. So this is exactly like the um, ATM problem. So M is an LBA and uh, w is in the language of the machine, so it is exactly the same notion as before, no difference. But the question is, well, is this decidable? So ATM is undecidable because we proved it. ACFG is decidable, so what is this? Could it be decidable or it might not be? So I'm going to claim here that this language, dun dun dun, is decidable, is in fact decidable. So in this, for this reason, just from that fact alone, you know that there must be some languages that a LBA cannot do that a Turing machine can do. So it really is a restriction of Turing machines because of this. Because if they were the same, well then this one would be undecidable too, but it's, but it, I claim it's decidable. So the thing is, with an LBA, it could run forever. So we can't use the strategy of the recognizer for ATM, which is just simulate the machine and then accept if it accepts. Because this LBA thing could run forever. Uh, and how can it run forever? Well, what it can do, for example, so here's the special character. Let's just say there are two characters here and maybe more, doesn't really matter. 
And then here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and forth between the first and second position and never stop. So I don't care what the values are there. I'm just going to move back and forth. So the LBA can run forever. So uh, we clearly, if we want to show that this is decidable, we need an alternate strategy. So how do we actually do this? Well, the thing is, well, if we think about what a computation history is, it's just a snapshot of what the tape contents actually are. Well, if we think about an arbitrary Turing machine, it can move right past the end of the input. But if we go right past the end of the input of where it is, we add additional space into the, into the configurations that we're looking at. So for an LBA, that's not possible because you can't, uh, you can't adjoin additional space. So then what we can ask is, uh, what is the number of possible uh, configs? With a Turing machine, it can be infinite because we can just add additional space and then get bigger and bigger configurations as we want to. But with an LBA, it's fixed. Once you know what the machine is, you know the number of configurations. Why? Well, think about what the machine is doing. Well, in this position right here, we can be in any one of the n possible positions. We're going to discount whether you're actually looking at the, these end markers. Um, it'll even if you include them, it's not going to make a real difference here. So what are we going to do here? Well, let's see. We should note several things. So the LBA can be in any of the N positions. Yeah, so the uh, I should say here, the LBA tape head. The tape head could be in any position. But what else could happen? Well, in this configuration, oh, let's just go up here. Well, in this configuration right here, we can be in any of the states. So, uh, so we handled, we can be looking at any one of the end characters, but the state itself can be any one of the character, any one of the possible states. So let's just say that the LBA uh, state could be in any of the possible states. It, it could be in any, any one of them. So let's just say that there are a queue of them. Uh, so let's just say uh, the number states is Q. And what else could happen? Well, on the tape itself, the first, second, all the way to the end, those tape contents can be anything. Um, yes, independently, possibly. So the first position can be any symbol, as long as it's a tape symbol. The second one can be any tape symbol, etc., all the way to the end. So what does that say here? Well, the tape contents can be anything. So what does that mean? Well, let's just suppose that the tape alphabet has G symbols. So uh, in other words, there are G symbols uh, for the tape. Well, the number of possible tape contents is what? Well, Let's think about the first position. Well, it could be any one of the G possible values. The second one could be any one of the G possible values, all independently. So that means that the number of possibilities is G to the N. So the total upper bound, because it could be way less than this, uh, depending on the machine, but an upper bound, certainly, number of configs that we can have is the number of possible tape contents, g to the n, times any one of the possible states, q, times any one of the possible n positions, which is n. 
So that's the number of possible configurations. Well, suppose, so I'm putting in red because this is the important part. Suppose that we run the LBA for some number at least g to the n times q times n, the number of configs, plus 1. Well, the plus 1 here is going to give us a pigeonhole argument in that we will revisit a configuration again. So this guarantees that a, um, yeah, so that, that guarantees a config is seen twice. Maybe more times, but twice. Well, the machine is deterministic. So it's going to do the same thing over and over and over. Because if we revisit a configuration we saw before, we will do the same thing again and again and again. So like going back to this example, so if we um, run this long enough, we will definitely have seen a configuration twice. We may have changed states all these times that we're doing this back and forth thing, but we will eventually guarantee to see a configuration twice, maybe many times. So this actually allows us, the, this uh, part right here, allows us to see when the LBA is going to run forever. So this can actually tell us something about what the LBA is really doing. Is it running forever or not? So what is a decider for, um, for A sub LBA do? So remember, the decider is a real Turing machine, but we're given an LBA as input, with an input, of course. So on input MW, where M is an LBA this time, and W a string. So what's the first step? Let's run the LBA M on W for G to the N times Q times N plus one transitions or until M stops, because it could stop prematurely. That's totally possible. So, but if it takes that long and it hasn't accepted yet, so if M has not accepted yet, then, uh, yeah, then we reject. Otherwise, we should accept. Because um, if it takes that long, well, we, we have found out whether the LBA actually is running forever. And by doing that, we can actually determine whether it's going to run forever without actually running the LBA forever. And by doing that, well, now we have been able to decide A sub LBA, which is pretty cool. So... The thing that's really interesting about this is that the Turing machine problem for acceptance, we can't actually determine whether or not we're going to repeat a configuration. Uh, I mean, we technically could, but it's just that um, the, the configurations can obviously grow and uh, they don't ever have to stop growing, whereas the LBA, they, they do. So... One thing that is actually kind of interesting, and I invite you to figure out, is um, can you find an explicit example of a language L that a Turing machine decides, so it's important that it decides here, but no LBA can decide. So, uh, yeah, so can you find an example of a machine, of a language where the Turing machine for it must use additional space than where the input is? Is there a machine that, uh, I mean, a language where every Turing machine for it, or at least some Turing machine for it, um, needs additional space? 
And uh, there are examples, and I invite you to actually think about how you would actually do it. So then you may want to ask the question about, well, what about the emptiness problem? So this is all of the LBAs, oops, so is an LBA with the language of M being empty. And so I'm not going to actually prove this, so this is done in homework 9. So actually that's what you're going to be doing, you're going to be doing in homework 9. Um, but it's, uh, it's actually shown to be undecidable, and that's what you're going to show in homework 9. Um, but there is another way that we're, that you can prove that it is undecidable, but I'm going to leave that for next time, so I'm going to do that then. So I'll see you.